Thank you. Really good sound from your laptop. If you had a headset, that may help, but uh, I appreciate not everyone has one available to hand. I understand that. So it's a case of just speaking fairly slowly and clearly towards the laptop and uh, yeah. we should be fine. Perfect. All right. Sounds good. Perfect. Thank you. Many thanks. Thank you. Bashir, would you like to try your microphone, please? Just to see yeah. that yeah. everything works, yeah? Yes, um, I came a bit earlier. Hi. On, behalf of, on behalf of the government of Senegal and then the African Union Commission, um, I welcome you all warmly to this session. Uh, prior to beginning, a special thanks goes to the International Organization for Migration, our partners, the UNDP as well. And then, yes, even though they are part of us as a commission, a special thanks goes once again to the African Institute for Remittances for their presence in today's meeting. Without much ado, I kindly hand in to um, Tanya, and then we proceed from here. So thank you so much for coming once again, and we're happy actually to apprise you on uh, several initiatives that we've been doing so far as uh, fostering diaspora co for cooperation sustainably on the continent is concerned. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angela. And uh, it is my utmost pleasure um, to moderate this session this afternoon. I very much uh, welcome all our distinguished participants um, who among this huge choice of side events uh, chose to attend our side event to learn more about the Diaspora Engagement Framework Program, an undertaking an initiative that, uh, as Angela mentioned, has been in the making for actually quite some time now. And we are very happy, very excited to have uh, a number of speakers who will be presenting to you the parts uh, that they have been working on uh, with us um, to make this framework program a wholesome framework program. And um, I will maybe, if you allow me, just uh, give you a very short um, rundown of uh, why we came up uh, with a framework, a continental diaspora engagement framework program. As you can see, um, the African Union Commission, CEDO, and IOM and UNDP, we have come together in uh, putting this together because we thought that um, given the number of initiatives, the number of projects that are ongoing in the countries of uh, African Union member states uh, working on the diaspora engagement framework, it would be an added value if these initiatives and um, projects were guided by sort of a framework. And um, if within this framework, the organizations coming together who have all developed a number of tools and approaches and methods in engaging with diaspora, from the diaspora investment toolkit to the, the diaspora self-assessment tool that has been developed by the AUC, the, integrate, the work on the integrated national financial frameworks that is carried out by UNDP to tools that have been developed by IOM on diaspora mapping, for example. The idea was really to bring all these tools together and offer them jointly um, two African Union member states to accompany and support governments wherever they are in their journey on diaspora engagement and supply them and equip them with these tools and with advice and with best practice. Um, so very shortly, we have uh, basically brought together all our combined expertise and knowledge 
around uh, four, let's say, pillars um, in this framework program. The first pillar is to increase capacity of African Union member states to develop and to implement evidence-based uh, policies to facilitate diaspora contributions. So this here, we offer all our tools and methods on data collection, um, increased availability of uh, data that's compliant also with data protection standards, and then based on this data uh, to improve uh, the capacity of uh, governments and diaspora organizations um, to develop uh, appropriate and timely policies and diaspora engagement strategies. Then the second pillar is essentially about um, African governments uh, designing and piloting effective mechanisms for diaspora financial resources and capital transfers with a focus on investment. And we will hear a little bit later from our colleague from UNDP, from OEA, how this is going to be operationalized. And then we have a third pillar, which is more about reinforcing institutional capacities of African Union member states to facilitate the transfer of knowledge and the transfer of know-how from diaspora. And so this is a lot about diaspora um, developing these mechanisms for this knowledge and skills and technology transfer. And it's also about facilitating um, the capacity development and, and gather the lessons learned and, and the activation of country networks to enhance this know-how transfer. And then we have um, also a pillar where we are looking at um, diaspora engagement in crisis, diaspora engagement in humanitarian settings. And here we will hear from our uh, dear colleague uh, from Shabaka, uh, Bashir Ahmed, um, what diaspora has already learned about uh, the engagement, the most effective engagement of diaspora in humanitarian settings. So um, I just wanted to provide you with a brief overview of what this framework program entails. And now I would like uh, to give the, uh, my first question will actually go to Bashir, so we will actually start from from the from the end, uh, simply because uh, our colleague will have uh, to leave a little bit earlier. So I'm going to ask my first question to our dear colleague Bashir Ahmed from Shabaka, which is a diaspora organization based in the UK from Sudan, um, about what are the key learnings share from the past few years on how diaspora has managed to address challenges in countries of origin, but also in their countries of destination during times of crisis. If we just think back, for example, on the most recent crisis that we have experienced with COVID-19. So, Bashir, did you hear my question clearly? Bashir, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, um, in this case, if Bashir cannot hear me, then maybe um, let me go back to another panelist. And, uh, and maybe Shabaka and Bashir can come in when, when she's connected again. So Angela, may I make uh, the beginning with you? Would you please tell us what are the steps taken so far by the African Union on harnessing diaspora for economic development? Apologies, um, if you can hear me now. Oh yes, yes, now we can hear you. Uh, right. Apologies again. Can no worries. No yeah. worries, the share. So, yeah. Did you hear the question? Did no, you hear yeah, the technology question? Right. My site today. Bashir, yes, did, I did. did you hear my question? 
Yes, I did. Um, All right. Please go with these, um, yeah, with the connections. Um, yeah, so um, I just wanted to say thank you for this opportunity. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And I do apologize about the um, the quality of the sound and uh, the network. Um, um, I guess it's kind of like, it's quite uh, an important question because one of the things is um, we've been kind of working on issues. Um, so my name is Bashar Ahmed, I work with Shabaka. And we've, what we've seen in terms of our work um, is a growing body of evidence that shows diasporas are crucial humanitarians and development actors. And this launch of this continental diaspora uh, framework is a really a testament to that, um, that this is recognized and uh, you know how uh, critical are diasporas uh, for this learning to be, um, you know, and the opportunity also to apply some of these learnings more systematically rather than just ad hoc basis is uh, which I, what we have seen for quite a while. So this is uh, a really a, a something that we welcome um, as a diaspora organization. There are several areas in terms of key learning. So um, from our work, which is, you know, um, motivations to participate you could see it across the diaspora it's that sense of when you're talking about the african uh, diasporas um so it's like the african spirit of mutual support but um but this is actually quite you know different for second subsequent generation so this is where this content framework needs to kind of also look beyond uh, just the first generation but also look sustainably on these groups um, another layer is that technology is really a critical vehicle and uh, diaspora, especially now with the pandemic, we've really seen that, um, that diaspora are utilizing technology, um, you know, social media online much more. Uh, for example, when the epicenter of the pandemic was in Europe, uh, we've seen examples of diaspora uh, medical uh, professionals who were sharing the, that learning with their origin country's colleague. Um, and the final point is about a need for genuine collaborations. So diaspora engagement needs to be designed with diasporas rather than having diasporas as recipients or, of products and services. So that kind of collaboration, having these kind of uh, discussions with the diaspora continuously is an ongoing pr pr uh, you know, process of building support and trust going forward. Um, I will leave it at that because I would love to kind of also hear from um, our other distinguished speakers about their thoughts about this. And uh, thank you so much for this opportunity again. Thank you very much, Bashir, for being with us this afternoon and uh, for sharing with us uh, these important lessons learned, especially on the last point, the fact that diaspora engagement strategies and diaspora policies should not be developed for diaspora, but with diaspora, I could not more than agree um, based on by now, actually decades of experience of working on diaspora engagement with um, a really very a variety of governments uh, that did that do and did engage with diaspora. So that is indeed a very important point, and I'm sure we will come back to that. So with this, I would then like to go back uh, to the order of things. And uh, Angela, may I address you now with the next question. And uh, since we basically um, skipped the round of introduction, can I just ask you, as you start to speak, to just briefly introduce yourself to the group? And my question for you would be, um, what are the steps taken so far by the African Union on harnessing diaspora for economic development? Thank you, Angela. Thank you very much, Tanya. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Angela Nafuliodai, as you all hear. I am the um, interim head of the diaspora division of the Citizens and Diaspora Directorate of African Union Commission, and I'm happy to be here. Um, Tanya and Shabaka, thank you so much, Bashaya, on your presentation. And I, I should assure you that the AU is setting the pace for working with diaspora, actually, because I should say that uh, we are having two portfolios that I'm going to discuss, which is the African Diaspora Finance Corporation, as well as the Af African Global Diaspora Marketplace, which are all diaspora legacy projects. The journey began in 2012. 
well in Stanton, South Africa, where we saw to it that there were member states or governments who actually heads of states who actually decided that there was the need to use some of these as tools to um, engage the diaspora and see about how best to harness the interests and the uh, values that diasporas bring into the socioeconomic development of the union and of the continent as a whole. So yes, in 2012, we started this. And I should assure you as well that we have diaspora representatives as consultants working on both projects. So that's another achievement that we've been working with diaspora for the interest of diaspora to actually propound all inclusiveness. So um, we started the work on the, we initiated the work on the African Diaspora Finance Corporation and um, in 2015, um, uh, in 2018 actually, we set together the plan of action and then we got, uh, we got acquired funding for it. And then we ensured as well that we are able to put together a business and strategic framework. This happened as a result of a lot of research and, and analysis that went into the work. We made sure that there was a feasibility done within and outside the AU, making sure that we strategized on the various stakeholders who would see to it that we indeed had a feasibility run and whether it was actually feasible for us to have a continental um, investment fund. We discussed as well whether they would want to actually see it situated within the uh, context of the AU or an independent organization. We got that it would be good for it actually to be a standalone with a board. Now, with the ADFC, it concentrates on migrant diaspora savings because we, we noticed that a lot of the time migrants or diasporas are able to remit when we talk of the huge remittances that comes together with it. But then what do they do about their real investment? How do they do the conduct these investments and how viable are they so far as the country is um, the uh, countries of origin or the continent? is concerned. So we started looking at probably um, give or take 17 million African migrants living after outside the continent as of then, as of 2018. Currently, the, with the World Migration Report, we have the uh, we have international migrants pegged at 19.5% million of the total of the population. And Africans actually constitute a huge number. Let's talk about the 200, over 200,000 oriental or historical African diaspora that we have in the Americas alone as a result of the transatlantic slave, slave trade, and then the numbers that we have so far as the IOM is concerned. How best do we harness some of these things towards our investments? So we realized that there was the need for us to actually look at how best we can conduct an innovative way of actually financing what we have and our, our developmental projects. In view of this, we had the, um, the launch of the African Diaspora Finance uh, Corporation. And then we set together the fact that it would be good for us to have various sessions. Per the AU standards, we had um, consultative meetings with key, with key stakeholders. We started the journey, and then we've been able to actually get the executive council to actually endorse this as an illegal instrument that we would be able to actually see about its operation. Now, so far as this is concerned, the, the structure of the diaspora investment in Africa, the, um, the strategic framework looked at diaspora investments when it comes to diaspora philanthropy. We looked at the socioeconomic investment, which has to do with diaspora remittances. We looked at economic and business investments and then diaspora uh, direct investments. We then looked at uh, regulated financial investment and then diaspora portfolio investments. We looked at the 55 member states and then we saw the migrant stock that they had. And then we noticed as well that it would be good actually when we are talking, when we are discussing equity of the African uh, diaspora and we are seeing about 
African SMEs raising an amount of 8.3 billion in equity. How do we actually translate these through money and then make sure that we are able to viably engage and then viably invest some of these? We looked at issues of sovereign bonds, the feasibility run across certain uh, diaspora bonds in various countries like Ghana, Kenya, and co, which could not actually yield. And then why they did not yield, how come the Nigerian example yielded? So we looked at some of these things as well. And then we saw that there was great potential actually in the fact that we would be able to actually harness uh, diaspora investment, investing in treasury bills, and investment accounts run by um, most African banks. And then we saw to it that there was the need actually for us to be able to see to it that this happens. So the vision for this is innovative and optimal usage of African diaspora resources for inclusive development in Africa. And then based on each, uh, it, based on this vision, we are focusing on diaspora savings and not diaspora remittances, enhancing options and opportunities for a blended way of financing diaspora portfolio investment and innovative finance and social enterprise. These are our main strands. And I inv innovative finance through uh, remittance match funding. And then we have structured financial uh, products in the form of diaspora bonds and then mutual funds. We have the impact investment through African institutional partners. And then we were thinking of forward investment in continental priority sectors. And this we have now gotten the accent of the AU. Then we have profits channeled through an endowment fund, which constitutes just 1% of your earnings into development and developmental trust, which will yield into developmental projects with on the continent. Then we have the social enterprise, which deals with the structure of mutuality and full reinvestment. So basically, this is what the Diaspora Finance Corporation is looking at. Now we have the global marketplace and we are looking at how best actually from the, uh, how best we can have access to funding from the African Diaspora Finance Corporation to segue into the global marketplace. The global marketplace refers strictly to entrepreneurship, innovative entrepreneurship, and sees how best to connect between uh, our diaspora and then businesses on the continent and seeing how best to maximize or scale up most of these businesses for the benefit of um, uh, first and foremost, the youth on the continent and then the continent as a whole, but capitalizing strictly on the youth. Now, so far as this is concerned, we've been able to work together under what we call the continent to continent dialogue of the Africa-Europe partnership. And we acquired consultants who are diaspora as well. And we managed as well to put together an inception report. Currently, the uh, currently we are uh, we touched on areas of how feasible is this? How feasible is this marketplace going to be? We touched on issues of which countries that we can look at on a, uh, at a pilot project, whereby we'll be able to actually see how best uh, countries with huge diasporas, countries with various friendly or diaspora friendly environments. I think uh, we have uh, uh, terrains. Currently, currently we are looking as well. I hear my internet is. I, I see my internet is unstable. Can you still hear me, please? We can hear you now again. You cut off maybe for just thirty seconds, but we can hear you. Okay. Um, and um, if I may, just ask you to uh, slowly wrap up so that okay. we can also hear from the African Institute okay. of Remit. Thank you. Perfect. So actually with the marketplace, we are seeing, we are trying to look at how feasible it's going to be made and how sustainable it can be as a continental uh, body. We are then going to see who will host and maintain this platform. Is it going to be public? Is it going to be 
public-private partnership, and whether it's going to be virtual or physical or both, we are looking at that feasibility. And we are seeing about innovative financing and investment mechanisms as well, the modalities that will be suitable for us having the marketplace. We are looking at how best to tackle structural barriers, actually, to diaspora investment, such as digital divide, such as forex and banking controls, legislative, um, legalese instruments in and doing business issues of doing business. And then finally, we are looking at how best the marketplace can support the AU's objective on the African continental free trade area. Basically, this is what we have. Thank you. And that is exciting stuff, if I may say so, Angela. Yeah, you have given us a lot of uh, really um, new ways of doing things and new initiatives. And I think what I would just like to highlight is that this African Diaspora Finance Corporation and also the global marketplace, from what I understood, is count breaking in that sense that it is fostering global diaspora, transnational diaspora engagement. Yeah? So we are trying to overcome, let's say, um, bilateral um, diaspora engagement where one diaspora community would focus only on the country of origin you know, in terms of investment, but we want with these tools, we want to open up these opportunities for African diaspora, no matter from which country they are, to look at Africa as a whole in terms of investment. And I think uh, the global marketplace where you want to foster especially innovation and youth and youth entrepreneurs, I think uh, there you would also have a very strong partner with the Af African diaspora network in the United States, um, where we know that they um, already work on, on um, supporting these change makers, let's say. Yeah? So really very exciting. Thank you for sharing that with us. And may I pass the floor now to Mr. Amadou Sisse. And I would also like to ask you, Amadou, to just briefly introduce yourself, um, tell everyone who you are, and then answer my question, which would be how as the African Institute of Remittances, how do you want to make remittances more impactful? Thank you very much. And the floor is yours. Thank you, Tanja. Uh, thank you for the question. Before I answer the question, allow me to thank the organiza uh, organizers. I mean here that I am the African Union for the African Union and the, Af uh, and the UNDP for coming together. And uh, I'm sorry, I am for coming together to uh, discuss this very important issue, which is the contribution of uh, diaspora in, 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 in general to the economic and social development in Africa. As you know, this has been recognized as one of the uh, means by, uh, in many uh, international documents, whether it is programs, whether it is uh, agenda or whatever. We tend, all the programs tend to uh, recognize the role, the potential role of the uh, uh, diaspora in general. And this is also happening in at the, um, let's say the national level as well, where we witness that many countries have tried to really uh, harness the potential of their diaspora. There are so many ways, uh, ways to do so, but one of them is really to look at some existing uh, uh, facts, and those are remittances. We cannot deny that remittances happen almost in every country in Africa. And then most of the diaspora, whether they stay in the continent, on the continent or they are abroad, uh, diaspora people still continue to support their family back home. Whether it is uh, the migrants in general, and when it is a very uh, narrow as definition, or it is really the broad approach of diaspora as uh, it is uh, uh, proposed by the African Union. The issue for uh, is that uh, you've mentioned it, you want it to be more impactful. The reason being that it's not really, we are not seeing that uh, much impact of all these flows coming into Africa. And the reason is that most of the time we don't have specific programs in the African countries so that they can leverage 
that, uh, the, that um, uh, those flows. What needs to be done? That's the question. And we cannot say that we can't have just one size fits all. The question is, uh, the solution depends on the continent, on, on the countries themselves, their specificities, but also it depends on the type of diaspora they have and the just type of people that receive the remittances. You cannot apply the same uh, uh, solution to all the countries. So this means that the first step is for our African countries to know the people that receive, not focusing on those who send, but mainly the people that receive. It is important that we focus on those ones because once money gets in their hands, if it needs to be uh, impact, if you have want to have uh, impact, you have to uh, be able to influence their behavior with that money. What are they going to do the, with that? And this is in line with the general definition of remittances. If you go to the uh, uh, specialized documents, they will tell you that remittance should be understood first as a revenue, a revenue for the person that receives that, uh, that remittances. And what do you do with your re revenue? We cannot tell them that you can't consume but we can change the behavior such as we can build what we call saving. This is the first step. How to build that? We need to train those people. You need to have to, 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 to if they are not fin financially include, uh, uh, included, you have to make sure that your financial inclusion strategy in many in a country it is, have a specific, specific com component uh, that takes into account this kind of people, these this, 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 uh, beneficiaries of uh, remittances. The starting point means, as I said, it is to understand, to know who is receiving, to influence their behavior, and this behavior is to make them, make, uh, to, to bring them, uh, to, uh, to, to allow them to, to, not to allow, but to, to help them to make some savings. And what's the next step? It is to be self-employed. Self-employed or employ uh, others. That's very key. Either it can be at the individual level or it can be, the, be done at the uh, community level. Meaning that you can bring together many people, many, many people that receive remittance in a particular area so that they can come together, crowdfund, and then start some activities. This is key, this is important. And you put uh, 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 on top of that, you put the, uh, the, the training that is needed for them to be able to manage that kind of business. If such strategies do not exist, it will be difficult that we, uh, uh, to be, we, 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 we go a step forward in terms of uh, making the remittances more impactful. The whole, whole idea is to empower the people that receive remittance. Now, we can have some additional uh, strategies that target the senders. And like it was in, uh, mentioned by, by, by uh, uh, Angela uh, earlier in her uh, intervention, it is looking at the savings once again of those who send remittance because those who send remittance have potential savings that they can also channel in specific project so that they can also have an impact in the, on, the, uh, on, the, on the continent. It's not easy, but to do so, there are some prerequisites. Among them, it is now the uh, uh, building trusts. African countries should be able to build, uh, uh, build trusts between them and their uh, uh, the, the uh, recipient uh, uh, beneficiaries, but between, also between them and the diaspora. If this cannot happen bilaterally, sometimes it can be difficult. International organizations can play this role of buffer so that when they come together, the international organizations, the diaspora organizations, the remittance uh, uh, beneficiaries, and the government, the four components, if they come together and put together a system, a transparent system that can help the recipient, uh, the, the beneficiaries to invest and then earn, that's one of the key request, uh, requests. And this is what at the Institute we are trying to do. 
This is what we do. It is to build, to propose some strategies, specific strategies to the, to the, to the uh, 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 African uh, governments. And this is uh, the, the whole work, the whole uh, uh, um, uh, objectives of the, of the African Institute for Remittances. It is to help the African countries to benefit, to, to, to harness the potential benefits benefit of remittances for their economic and social development. We are not addressing the macroeconomic impacts because in a way or another, when flows are here and they, they, uh, they are in this uh, banking system, it helps the countries to face their, uh, to, 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 to build their, their external reserves. It is there, it is about macro uh, uh, policy, it is about uh, monetary policy, whatever, it will be always there. What is lacking is the impact on the individuals that receive remittance now. We are not addressing the macroeconomic aspect, but the microeconomic aspect, that's what we have to address and that's what we do. And for that to succeed, in, we, don't, we do not advise our countries to have specific programs on remittances and their beneficiaries, rather to to, to, allow, to take into account that kind of people in all the existing development programs, whether it is in terms of entrepreneurship, what segment or what are you proposing for those who receive remittance? It has to be there. Whether in terms of financial inclusion, what are you proposing in your financial inclusion strategy that is specific to the person that receive remittances. And I can go on, go on, go on, go on about that. It is what we propose to our countries so that it won't be a new, uh, new, new, new uh, mechanism or whatever, but it is to make everything inclusive, to make everything, you know, uh, 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 talking each other rather than having separate programs for the uh, diaspora. For now, that is what I wanted to, 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 to share with you, Tanja. If time allows, we'll be very happy to answer questions, additional questions you may have or your audience. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amadou. In fact, I can already see a question in the chat. And so therefore I would like to, before we come to the questions um, um, from our participants, I would just like to also give the floor now to uh, our colleague from UNDP, Oria. Um, so that we basically close the, the, pre the presentations, what we wanted to, to everyone to know about uh, the work foreseen uh, within this framework program. Amadou, thank you very much for highlighting the need to actually look at the recipient side of those uh, who are receiving uh, remittances and to work on their understanding. You mentioned several times maybe also using behavioral science to, to influence or to nudge their behavior. Um, when we talk about financial literacy, what to do with remittances, how to build savings, how to use these remittances um, also for more productive purposes. And the need, you know, not to reinvent the wheel, not to come up with new things, because uh, a lot has already been put in practice, a lot has already been tried, but rather to communicate and to actually bring all these efforts together. And that is exactly what we also want to achieve with this framework program. So thank you very much, Amadou, for your contribution. And uh, Oria, may I ask you to also quickly introduce yourself, please, to our participants? And then my question for you is um, actually on the integrated uh, national financial frameworks and uh, remittances as one possible source of financing for development. And if you actually would like to um, focus in your reply on, on uh, more particular aspect, aspects, please feel free to do so. Thank you, Oria. Thank you so much. And let me start by, by thanking all of you, um, Angela and Tanya um, and Amadou and, and uh, uh, Bashar um, for the, well, 
inviting us uh, to be to come to this already ongoing train that you had initiated where you have um well integrated because at the end what uh, you are all talking is about this need to to find synergies and integrating and i think um this this uh, framework that we're launching today is about that um about seeing what all of us um, are doing that is interconnected and and seeing how um, we can boost and um, well, we can make the best use of um, of um, the remittances or the diaspora as um, investment for the development of uh, the countries that we serve. So um, what I'm going to, to share is um, where we come from as UNDP in this uh, bigger ongoing picture. Um, and it was uh, through the INFF, the Integrated National Financing Framework. You might have heard, you might not have heard, is uh, an acronym that is made out of uh, extracting some words of the Addis Ababa Action Agenda. And at the end, the spirit of what it is uh, referring, it's about integrating public and private actors behind the national development priorities. It is about demystifying finance as such, but also making sure that there is a national dialogue around the financing agenda, around the financing of the national development priorities uh, and aiming at uh, uh, well, setting up uh, and implementing those priorities at national and subnational level. So um, this is where we come from with this bigger macro vision, uh, having this these two um, objectives: um, the vision of a diaspora as a key interlocutor into the national development process. So making sure that. Um, as Bashar was referring, you know, there are diaspora engagement strategies are prepared and for and, 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 and developed by diaspora, but also making sure that they are integrated into the national development plan and the financing strategies of those national development plans. So, um, and also the second vision is, uh, well, how do we um, all in this uh, digital finance uh, word, um, we make sure that we make uh, benefits of um, and we expand the digital remittances market for the benefit of, uh, well, the, the diaspora that is sending its savings uh, to their families, but also to make sure that um, the recipients also uh, will make best use of it. Um, so there is uh, this bigger agenda, as I was saying, the INFF, we have uh, two tools. Uh, um, in the INFF that we are putting forward in this um, uh, well, joint framework and joint partnership is uh, the development finance assessment, which is a tool that we have already implemented uh, with the ministries of finance, um, and we have uh, currently 22 DFAs, uh, development finance assessment, that were developed in many of these DFAs. We have information from um, which needs to be further develop, developed always, right? We have the question about what is coming in through remittances. So there is this bigger macro information, but how about the informal remittances? How about the foreign direct investment that is actually from the diaspora? So um, there is a number of questions that are coming up, but there is data that is being collected through the DFA. Um, there is also the, um, through another assessment that we're undertaking, which is the SDG investors mapping. From the national development plan, we are able to extract the key development priorities and transform it into an investable um, intelligence. So information on what are the key subsectors uh, that will contribute to the national sustainable development um, of a country. Um, and uh, what are what is the investment return that um, that um, well these subsectors could bring. So this is these are two tools that are bringing data information that could be interesting for diaspora and also for the governments and um, policymakers and regulators so that they can set up proper integrated uh, policies for diaspora. The second angle is the financing strategies. Through the financing strategies, we are setting up we're integrating reforms on the public finance, but also on the private finance. This is where we see that all those diaspora um, uh, strategies can be should be integrated, not as a separate, but making sure that they all together will 
all be leverage for the national development um, uh, priorities of the country. The third, third angle is about setting up systems for monitoring and review of the budget allocation of the expenditures of how the public investment is undertaken in the country. We see obviously the key role of diaspora um, in these uh, platforms that we're setting. And uh, lastly, the fourth element is about coordination systems, about governance systems. And this is the whole of society. This is what I was referring at the beginning as the need to set up platforms for dialogue around SDG financing. And obviously we also see the strong value of diaspora in, from this perspective. So I'm going to stop here. I think I already provided uh, some hints of information. I will put, post in the chat the link to mm -hmm. the INFF so mm -hmm. that if um, um, anybody's interested to have more information, um, you can have it there. And I'm happy to respond to any question. Over to you, Tania. Thank you, Aria. So I think actually we have talked a lot now. Um, our last three speakers have talked a lot about economic development and engaging with diaspora on remittances, on investment, and what we need uh, to, to look at. Um, and I think um, with this, I would like to give now uh, the floor, let's say, to our participants. I see in the chat that there was a question from, uh, wait a minute, let me go to the first one here. If someone can also help me, that would be very welcome. But I can see one question here from Elvino Nantumbo. And he is asking about the use of GRID, um, saying that this is a very powerful tool for comparative spatial analysis. And he thinks it would be very useful to compare statistics in terms of sending and receiving remittances and the impact of remittances on countries of origin. Um, GRID, he further explains, is a cartography tool that consists of georeferencing data in squares, which guarantees realistic comparisons. And he would like to hear the understanding of our distinguished panelists on this topic. So this is the first question. And I would like to ask if any of you, Angela, Oria, or Amadou, if you have heard about GRID and if you if you would like to respond to this question. Oria, I can see you are nodding. Would you like to give it the first shot? I'm not sure I'm going to be able to respond to the question, but I, I can say I witnessed and I was engaged um, through the invitation and kind invitation of the IFAD colleagues um, through one of these um, discussions uh, at country level, uh, and it was, if I recall, um, in Kenya and another one in Uganda. Um, and, um, and I did found it as a very, very um, integrated um, um, and very interesting, oh, I would say inclusive uh, type of platforms where you could see and hear from the different stakeholders um, uh, linked to diaspora and remittances. Um, so it is an existing uh, structure. Um, that in my view also will benefit uh, from linking with uh, our partnership and including with the partnership of the ministries of finance who were not represented in those discussions. So I think this is also something that all of us together we can bring um, to that other uh, bigger platform which is quite real and it's very informative and it's creating mm -hmm. very interesting reports. So thanks. Thank you, Oria. Uh, Angela or Amadou, any additions to this? Um, otherwise, I would also move on to another comment. Um, yeah, Amadou, did you want to come in on the GRID? Yeah, uh, uh, th thank you, Aurea. For, for, uh, sorry, <laughs> Tanya, for, for that uh, question. Uh, the fact is that, uh, you know, uh, we have uh, many tools that addresses the issue of uh, remittance itself, uh, the, uh, the flows, the costs and everything. And those tools, they are very powerful through. What is lacking here, and we are not saying that that is not important. It is very important to know the flows and then to be able to track them. 
what, it, what is lacking is that for now, there is no information about those who receive remittance, who they are, what they do with that. That's the question. And some country, countries have started to really identify the, 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 the recipients, who they are. And based on that, you will build some additional tools that will address the needs of the people on the ground. That's, the, that's, that's what I wanted to, to, to say with regard to this uh, question. Yes, it is important to know the flows, those uh, how much it is, at which cost. That's fine, that's important. Who are the players on the ground and everything. But we want to go a step ahead. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's where we are, thank you. Thank you, Amadou. And I have uh, another uh, comment from Elvina Kaysen, uh, Diaspora Engagement Specialist with uh, EUDIF at ICMPD. Um, she is saying it is interesting to look at diaspora funds beyond remittances and look to savings. If focusing on savings, then a return, return on investment for the diaspora must be central as remittances are generally given with no expectation of return or minimal return. However, savings are a safety net, a source of funds for emergencies, retirement, and even relocation. So the motivation with this source of funds is to see it grow. The attitude then is to regard these funds as you would look at returns for an investor. And I think here yeah, I would also like to uh, turn to Anjana because I think the African Diaspora uh, Finance Corporation um, is one of the vehicles which I think uh, wants to also provide returns on investment, but I can also see Amadou is uh, on screen. So I open the floor to any of you three financial experts, um, if you would want to comment on this comment from Elvina, who would like to go first? Okay, I'll go first and say hello to Elvina. Elvina has been of immense support to us because she's been running a lot of related diaspora business clubs and all that in the UK prior to joining the EU DIF. Now, um, so far as this is concerned, you're very right on this, Elvina, and that is the reason why we have various portfolios of engagement. So beyond these remittances are your savings. What we are saying is out of your savings, how much would you want to invest on the continent into developmental, uh, into developmental um, projects? And then how much would you want to use the profit that comes out of these to support uh, charity causes? For example, when we are looking at issues of remedy, we know that when you are, uh, as diaspora, when you uh, contribute towards charity, you get these tax refunds coming back to you. Now, you can use these as well as part of your packages to invest on the continent and then see how best one, it's, uh, you, you, you're fulfilling your main goal as diaspora, making sure that the continent is benefiting or uh, through your philanthropy, the, the, the continent is benefiting or viably uh, comfortable. Secondly, you know where your money is going to and where 1% of your profit is going, to, of your earnings is going to. So this is something you have, um, you as diaspora are determined to actually carry on with this. Having all the information on the, um, having all the information as in you invest A, you, this is what you're going to get A plus plus. All right, Anjana, um, thank you very much for your initial response um, to Elvina. I actually realized, colleagues, that we are almost at a full hour. So uh, if you allow, I will... As a result of... If you allow, I will actually um, pass the floor on um, to... Ambassador, um, Ambassador Amr Mohammed Ayouvaili, 
I'm sorry for the mispronunciation of your last name, but uh, Ambassador Amr Mohammed is the special advisor to the deputy chairperson of the African Union on Strategic Partnership and Stakeholder Engagement. And Ambassador, um, we are very honored uh, by your presence to our side event here this afternoon. And uh, I would like to ask you to actually close this uh, side event and um, please um, take the floor and, uh, and help us in wrapping up and closing up this side event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, um, dear moderator, and congratulations for um, very efficient uh, management of this uh, session. Allow me to also thank um, um, all the speakers um, that we've um, that we've um, listened to very um, actively. Um, uh, representatives of Shabaka, uh, Dr. Bashir, of course, the African Institute of uh, uh, Remittances, our um, good colleague, um, Executive Director Amadou Sisi, um, and of course the UNDP. Um, um, senior expert on SDG finance, uh, Ms. Oriam Goni, and I'm very, very impressed by the active participation of the audience as well. Um, I see that they have introduced themselves, and I really hope that this is a starting point for an ongoing dialogue, since the issues that were raised here um, are of um, relevance. Um, to uh, to the future. I'll just um, I'd also like to highlight the you know active role that uh, CEDO, the Citizen and Diaspora um, uh, Director at the African Union Commission, here represented by our good colleague and able um, uh, coordinator um, Angela Odai, and of course Betty, uh, also the acting uh, director uh, for the work that they have done. What I would probably like to take out of this and share with you is that the African Union Commission is devoting uh, particular um, attention this year uh, to diaspora issues. Um, as we said, because we are celebrating uh, the 10th anniversary of the Johannesburg um, um, of the Johannesburg um, uh, summit, um, and also because we are in parallel launching and operationalizing and institutionalizing um, the decade for people of African descent that is led by the Republic of Togo 21 to 31. So we have um, we have um, um, a stock taking exercise of the last 10 years from Johannesburg, and we have a forward looking exercise uh, for the decade. Um, 21 to 30 uh, to 31. Maybe to um, try, it's almost impossible to summarize all the rich uh, ideas that were raised, but I would like to come back to the framework that the Dublin Global uh, Development Summit um, uh, shared, which was um, um, spearheaded by IOM, and I salute IOM for its work in this regard, represented by you, dear moderator, and of course the government of Ireland at the time, which is looking at diaspora from four perspectives. From the perspective of economic capital, social capital, cultural capital, and human slash knowledge capital. And I think many of the ideas that were raised today come back to this uh, um, um, categorization, which I think is a useful prism for us uh, to, um, and to feed in with these practical, concrete um, examples um, um, so that we can um, fully realize the potential of uh, engagement of uh, diaspora uh, for the African continent in particular, since we all belong to it, but also I think um, it could provide them, um, um, a framework of uh, engagement for, for the world um, in general. So we see this uh, um, webinar, we see this side event as a starting point for an ongoing dialogue, and we'll be very happy to take on all the ideas that were raised and developed them further. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Indeed, um, this was a perfect closing and wrapping up of uh, what we have heard and what we have discussed today. And I think all that remains for me is to also give a very big thank you to all our panelists and to our participants, uh, those people who joined us, listened in, um, took interest in, in wanting to learn more about what this diaspora engagement framework wants to do, what it can do. And I think we have really heard some groundbreaking, some really innovative uh, new vehicles like the African diaspora financial framework, uh, finance corporation, I'm sorry. And um, we are all excited, I think, as we are here to take this forward uh, with, with diaspora as our main partner. And um, with that, I would like to wish you all a very pleasant afternoon, a very nice evening. And I want to thank you again for joining us for this side event. And 
Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. Goodbye. Bye. bye. Goodbye.